It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 275 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 20th of August 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And on today's show we'll be talking about a potential peanut allergy cure and finding cakes and volcanoes in Antarctica. But first we want to thank Ryan James, Dan Kruger, Josh Kingston Lee, Brett Henry, EJ, Chris Curtin McGee, Sean McElligot, Richard Sutherland and Pete Ellinger, all of our terrific Patreon subscribers who help us each week. And if you want to join them and help us out, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate and uh, pledge per episode. Really appreciate that. But now, Penny, this week I saw a number of news outlets touting a cure for peanut allergies. This comes from a study done at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute here in Melbourne. And it's actually a follow-up on an experiment done four years ago, isn't it? Mm, mm. And it's interesting because I think I read somewhere and I couldn't find this source, not that I looked hard, but that Melbourne is one of the cities in the world that is most where most peanut allergies, like it's really common in I've Melbourne heard that for too, some yeah. reason. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a really interesting treatment and I would love to know more and see what happens if you can relate this treatment back to what's causing such an increase in peanut allergies. So the way it works is that you're, the people who have the peanut allergy, the children in this case, are given a probiotic along with a small amount of peanut flour. And as the treatment goes on, the amount of peanut flour is gradually increased. And what the probiotic does is it's one called uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus, so raminosis, no, ramnosis. Anyway, <laughs> yep. we all suck at Latin names. <laughs> um, it's one that's in, found in small doses in yogurt, but they given a really high dose with this peanut flour. And it apparently it's, it acts on the immune system. So it essentially encourages the immune system to relax and not go overboard. So an allergic reaction is basically when something essentially harmless like pollen or, you know, um, peanuts, for example, which most of the world's population can eat. It's not like they're poison, but the immune system goes, whoa, invader, have to like get rid of it. And it just goes so overboard that it's threatening to the person or it causes a, a poor reaction in the person. So what it does is, is this probiotic encourages the immune system to generate a protective response rather than a allergic response. It's, I'm not sure how that works. Like I'm not, this is not my field, mm. but as over time, this is given in conjunction with peanut flour, the immune system learns to recognize the proteins that are triggering it and see them as, not see them, but you know, regard them as safe. This is a normal thing that we don't go overboard and react to. And the outcomes were really, really uh, promising. So I think... So they, they first did that yeah, four years ago. With, yeah. And then they had really good results then. I think it was something like an 82%... Uh, yeah, I think 80, 82% uh, immediately after tr the treatment four years ago could eat peanuts. Yep. And then 80% of those children four years later could still eat peanuts. So this is not a 100% thing. It's not like it will work for everyone or last for everyone hmm. at this stage, but it looks like for a really large chunk of people with peanut allergies, this could be really, really helpful. And I think it would, um, I mean, it's, there's so much stress nowadays around food and nuts. And I think there's so much stress over peanuts, like people forget all the other kinds of, things that are potential allergens and it's almost like peanuts are becoming poison but if there's something that you could do to help kids and I'm guessing adults too with these allergies to not 
you know, like you can't even, there's certain brands of ice cream and everything's like, oh, make and train traces, you know? It's the worst thing yeah. to be allergic to because everything yeah. has something to everything do with peanuts or is made in a factory peanuts. that also has peanuts. Yeah, that has peanuts. Yeah. I mean, not being able to have ice cream, that's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I think it's also important to note that, I mean, we're talking of small study at the moment. I think it was only yeah. uh, 40 or 50 kids and only mm. half of those, 28, were given the probiotic and protein mm. thing. The rest were a control group. So, yeah. you know, if you were to do this in an experiment of a 1,000 people, there's just as much chance that it could be a lesser effect than a greater effect. Yeah. And, and you also wonder, because I know um, childhood allergies – you know, a lot of people have a childhood allergy that doesn't last through to adulthood. Hmm. So you wonder how many of those kids may have been developing out it. of that. Yeah, tolerance anyway. anyway. And the other thing I think we need to remember is this hasn't been a proper controlled study in that they haven't tested small amounts of protein, of the peanut protein being introduced compared to the protein and the probiotic introduced mm, at the same mm. time. So we've only got... I was going to ask you exactly that. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, did they... Because you mentioned there was a control group and I'm thinking, did they just gradually increase their exposure as well to sort of, you know, in case there was a, uh, you know, an exposure effect that over time had diminished? Um, I because, don't believe uh, that would they did. probably be unethical. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're in the control group. How do you know? Well, you're the one who's dying. Um, <laughs> oh. so, <laughs> just get your EpiPen. Yeah. <laughs> you, you'd, you'd pretty yeah. quickly know, I would guess, if you're in that kind of control group. We, when I've mentioned before that my son has an um, anaphylactic level issue with crustaceans. And I remember once we were seeing an immunologist about just to get him tested, retested to see how he was tracking. And, and they do, you know, they do the, like the pinprick tests and stuff. And, and they did this on on my son and he and he started reacting quite severely with with like right you know from one single exposure and the dude kind of freaked out he kind of like oh my god oh have you got your epi pen <laughs> this is not what you want to be seeing when you're, no. you're the specialist and yeah. like uh yeah he just he kind of his eyes went a bit wider it's like oh my god what do we do <laughs> i've killed him what have i done yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, i'm glad he was all right but uh it's yeah, you can't be too careful, really, which is a shame because, you know, as we're saying, you can't even bring something that's perfectly fine for your kid who doesn't have any allergies. You can't bring anything with peanuts to school where other kids might have it and everything. It has and a I huge effect that's everywhere. Also really dangerous because peanuts are not the only allergen. And there's this like, oh, it's a nut free school, so it's fine. But people could be allergic to, you know, sesame seeds or, yeah, like shellfish. And there's no schools you know, are a lot harder because there yeah. you know, there's there's many many more students and mm. there's a much wider age spread mm. and by school age at least kids um, are more aware of, of the effects on yeah, themselves yeah. and they can report it they can take action with epipens and so forth but at, at preschool and kinder and that sort of thing it's it's a much higher risk because the kids don't recognise or they know don't what understand. The, yeah, so so there they, you know, it's a part of their enrolment process to what, what are they allergic to so that we have allergen advice here um, so that all the staff know what to do, any parent helpers, and they're up on signs all around the place. So we, you know, my wife's kinder will go one year to the next. It might be peanut-free this year. Next year it might be, you know, caviar-free or something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard because it's you know there's so like, annoying when it's caviar free. Oh, yeah, they're the that's worst. That's going to affect those three year olds. <laughs> but even things like you know strawberries and kiwi fruit and cow's milk. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's um, yeah, as I say, by the time they're at school, you it's really about um, mm. you know, Manage- helping them to to manage it themselves. And and my son, like he's he's since diagnosis, he's only twice been exposed to things in the wild, and both those times it was our fault um, because you know. What are you trying to say, we Lucas? <laughs> we just didn't uh, recognise the the risk of what he was what he was having, and it wasn't something he ate either. Like once was we were away holidaying, and he picked up a, a crab shell off the beach, like a like oh. a hollowed out empty crab sh- crab shell that looked like it'd been there for five years mm. and uh, played with it in his hand. And then that night his face all swelled up and I got told off for not sunscreening him properly, but it wasn't that oh. at all. Um, oh, so, 
so yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, little things like that. And, mm. and um, you know, you think of how long something like that has sat there, but there were still proteins yeah. that were enough to set him off. And there was no, you know, he didn't ingest it at all. But, you know, he had all around his eyes and his face was all blotchy and, yeah, it wasn't good. Oh, I know. And part of me wonders, and I almost am reluctant to even voice this, but I wonder if there's also a degree of that hygiene hypothesis where we've gone so panicking, this is a a nut-free school and everything, in that everyone's exposure to nuts has decreased, that they're not getting that kind of immune adaptation you know what I'm saying? It might, and it might like, not just be nuts. It might be other things in the environment mm. that they're not so exposed to because of the, um, the, the, as you say, this this hyper cleanliness and and you think of when we were kids. You know, we we were outside a lot more and you know putting rocks in our yep. mouths and all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, well even um, <laughs> like yogurt is essentially classy off milk. You know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. All our food is completely fresh and blah blah blah. Yeah. But I mean, this yeah. bacteria, this probiotic was it's you know, similar to what is in yogurt. Mm-hmm. Yes. But we're probably not eating that much off food anymore. And yeah, like, yeah. I guess if you grow, if your ancestors evolved eating off food the whole time, your body, prob- you know, your immune system has evolved to kind of cope that with that. And, and natural selection goes, well, we lose a few, it doesn't matter. But yeah. I do, I do want to put this disclaimer said before, here. Penny, the- <laughs> We're, yeah, we're not medical yes. uh, experts. Oh, and no, no, no. Do not just go, well, they said on Science on Top that maybe we're, you know, not exposing kids yeah, to peanuts enough. Don't, don't do that. No, don't no. Don't do that. No, absolutely. <laughs> don't be doing that. Um, I, I, you mentioned um, in the story, Penny, that uh, Melbourne's got one of the highest incidents yeah. in the world for peanut allergies. And, if, and that's, that's clearly a, a, quite a strong case for it being an environmental thing. Um, mm. The question is, what is the thing? What 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 is it? Because we don't really know yet. What's well, what causes this? Something I heard once is it's also we also have high asthma rates, and it's like a lot of people with European heritage being around a lot of nat- like Indigenous Australian pollens and stuff. I have no idea if that's true, but something like a mismatch between the vast majority of the populations sort of. What been, I've heard with so many things over the last twenty years yeah. that that are, are thought to be contributing yeah. factors, but the, and and I think that's kind of the that's part of the problem that there are so many things mm. that maybe together cause you know a, a greater incidence of, of risk factors rather than it's this yeah one just thing. one thing mm. it's just yeah. a perfect storm so, of something yeah but exactly. it, it, you wonder if this treatment if it is effective if it would work with other things because I know that's not a given yeah. like. I was wondering the same. I mean, certainly mm. the, the mechanism that's at play here, assuming the mechanism is similar for the other allergies, yeah. you would think that it might work. But, you know, the, the stories didn't have enough detail about that. And obviously, mm. I mean, as you said, Ed, it was such a small study as well. Mm. Um, you know, there's very few involved in it. But, you know, these things are promising, though. They, they're really promising. I mean, I, I know, you know, 20 years ago, it was a case of, okay, is this because of our cleaning products? Is it because of the, the foods that we're eating? Is it the, are we over processing foods? Are we not getting enough uh, fresh foods? So there was a lot, there was, there was really just sort of, we have no freaking idea. Whereas, you know, it's really dialed in over time and there's um, the, obviously being autoimmune response, we knew that right from the start, but other things that um, are correlated with it in terms of, um, you know, some family history of, of things like hay fever and, and um, you know, eczema and this sort of thing are often, you know, often go hand in hand with it. But, uh, but yeah, I've heard some crazy things over the time. It's like, oh, we've just seen a, a correlation of people using these chemicals to wash their clothes. It's like, man, come on. <laughs> it's, it's perfect, really good to make you feel guilty as a parent because you, you don't know what you're doing wrong to cause your child to be unhealthy it's, or, you know, to be sick. It's very uh, frustrating. Have you not learned anything from advertising? As a parent, yeah. you should be guilty as, as a, guilty a base dad. status. Yeah. yeah, that is your yeah. your role is to be guilty. But um, yeah, no, uh, guilty. I think that's that's a good one. I don't want the people to leap at this thinking it's oh, it's a cure in five years' no. time. We'll just be able to take a pill and we'll be done or anything like that. It's just going to take a lot more study, a lot bigger scale experiments. But yeah, we'll. We'll but I also, happens. I it's saw that they're, they're looking to develop a commercial thing, but even that commercial treatment is like a dose of powder every day for 18 months. Yeah. Like this is not just a pill. 
But if yeah. it meant I could still, have peanuts I mean, oh, and no, ice no. cream, yeah. I would but, totally yeah, yeah. do that. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people do that just to know that they, they then weren't, you know, they didn't have a risk from exposure indirectly, let alone be able to mm. eat the damn stuff themselves. I mean, that's just yeah. a dream. Mm. So, mm. yeah, my son uh, really loved uh, crayfish and uh, prawns when he was a kid, but, yeah, can't have them now. We can't have them now. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is <laughs> not fair. <laughs> that's your punishment as a guilty parent. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Whenever we go away, it's like oh, seafood. Christmas. <laughs> not, not, yeah, I was gonna not, say, not do you guys just go out like for dinner just yourselves and be like, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it's usually like if we go away basket, so that because it can be like you know, the, it could be the next day if we've eaten something. Mm. You know, like imagine if we had a seafood basket or something like that, and mm. we oh, and then, we then came know. home, and the very next day we you know we we touch surfaces and whatever. It can it can be yeah. that mild the exposure, but uh, you know over time the exposures get you know, higher and higher and higher. And things like seafood, as one of the stories mentioned, that seafood and a few other of these allergies tend to be lifelong. Mm. So peanut ones tend to be lifelong as well. They're not something you grow out of. Like oh, so they're not one of the grow out. out ones. Yeah. No. So, yeah. Well, yes. high doses of yogurt and very tiny bits of... Cra- no, don't, don't do the experiment yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tiny little shrimp. <laughs> In your yogurt. Shrimp yogurt. Oh there you go. God, oh, yogurt. that does not sound good. Hmm. Doesn't sound good. Really doesn't. Let's move on. What's that fish paste? <laughs> did, did, you, did you ever have that fish paste? I just, just suddenly popped into my head that it was something that I used to be fed as a child. And, and what? It's really gross. I was never no, I know. fed it I as know. a child. Yeah. I'm sure it's been in things that I've on had. On a sandwich. Oh, really? Yeah, Sandwiches. like on a sandwich, like a yeah. spread or something. Yeah, I remember I that. I, it's like that. sort of a weird pink colour. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was not natural. It popped into my head. It was not natural. I don't want that. <laughs> it was I really not don't want to color. see that again. <laughs> All right. Well, if you were to ask most people where the largest volcanic region on Earth is, they would probably say something like the Pacific Rim or the east coast of Africa. But a project by Edinburgh University researchers has just found 91 more volcanoes beneath two kilometres of ice in western Antarctica. And I guess the real worry, Lucas, is whether or not any of them could erupt, which would have huge ramifications for sea levels. Wouldn't, wouldn't be it? good. Wouldn't be good. Yeah, wouldn't no. be good. <laughs> wouldn't be good. I think it's important to just point out that two kilometres below, uh, two kilometres of ice meant two kilometres below the ice. There's not like an area of two kilometres with ninety-one Sorry, volcanoes yeah. in it. Yeah. Because that's two uh, kilometres deep. That's of very ice. scary. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this tiny little area. So this is um, basically in in Western Antarctica. It's um, an area that's that's known to have quite a few volcanoes. There was already something like forty seven odd volcanoes that were known to be there, and and previously they knew about volcanoes because you know they're volcanic sort of shapes and they stick out of the ice. So you know they make themselves known. But there's a lot of ice there. Um, in some cases, up to about four kilometers deep. So it can be hard to track these buggers down. So there was a, a, a study that was um, kicked off. It was, it was actually a pretty cool story. There was a, a, the study was kicked off by, at the time, an undergraduate who sort of asked the question, well, how do we know how many are there? We know that there's, they're, they're quite, you know, there's quite a few volcanoes there, but how do we really know how many are there? Because there could be heaps of them under the ice. So it was a study that, that involved uh, reviewing a whole lot of data that already existed and also some, some gathering of new data, which um, involved things like you know, surface penetrating radar and so forth to look for the signs of the basalt rises under the ice coming up towards the ice, these cone shapes. And, you know, they expected, they, they certainly hoped to find some, but they were pretty surprised to find this many, 91, as you said, um, uh, adding to the previous 47 that they already knew about. And they ranged in size as well. There were some that were sort of, you know, around 100 metres tall, so not very big. Others that were almost four kilometres tall. I mean, these are big. These are, these are, these are, some of them are quite big volcanoes. And, it, and it, if it's correct, if this finding is correct, then it also means that this would become probably the most populated area of volcanoes in the world and as you said it would it would rival parts of Africa where you know um, volcanoes like Kilimanjaro and so forth are uh, which previously you know was was one of the the record holders so that would be um, pretty uh, pretty cool but (laughs) as you said kind of scary yeah so ice um, when you heat it up it melts and 
when you have volcanoes erupting, they make heat. It's lava, and it comes out, and it's hot, and it burns, and it or certainly melts ice. And you know, I'm I'm making light of it, but it would actually be really, really bad if this were to occur. And uh, so, what they're looking at next is how active are these things? How often do they erupt? Because they do know that some of the more active regions right now are areas that had previously been under glaciers or under ice sheets. Um, such as Iceland, for example, and, uh, and parts of Greenland uh, that had been under ice sheets before. And the, and the reason they think, of, they think that they um, became more active once the ice sheets had, mo- had, had sort of melted was the pressure of the ice sort of acted a bit like a, a bit of a cork on the, on, the, on the volcanoes, keeping them from erupting because, you know, that, that amount of ice is a huge amount of pressure. So you get rid of it and, um, or even you get rid of some of it and then there's less pressure. So... You could end up with yet another kind of feedback loop here of, um, you know, we, global warming contributes to the, um, you know, thinning out of the ice sheet, then there's less pressure, then one of the volcanoes goes, and then they could sort of go like dominoes, which is pretty terrifying. Can we stop finding more doomsday scenarios that can happen at climate no, we change? No, we, we, we keep can't be doing it. Every time I think I've got a grip of all the terrible things that can happen as a result of climate change, something else comes along. Yeah, you know right. nothing, Jon Snow. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> so, yeah, things, um, you know, it's it's one of those stories that, oh, wow, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool that they found them. It's really cool how they found them and that they even thought oh. to look for it. But it's scary. But we don't know. There's no way to sort of even tell if... The, they have been active recently or they will be active in the near future? Well, they, they, there's a hypothesis that because of the density of these volcanoes that there's, there's probably going to be more of these volcanoes um, in the sea off to the west of, of Antarctica. So they will be obviously easier to survey and easier to gauge that sort of thing. So that's another one of the next steps is to find... Um, some more of these volcanoes that might be in the sea, and uh, and you know, and have a look at how active they've been because we can get to them. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite um, quite horrifying. Right. Well, while we're talking about finding things in Antarctica, conservators with the New Zealand-based Antarctic Heritage Trust have just found a 100-year-old fruitcake in Antarctica's oldest building. And of course, Penny, the question everyone wants to know, just what was Prince Philip doing in Antarctica? (laughs) (laughs) That's not nice, Edward. uh, He can't. He's not listening. Uh, He doesn't care. So it's a racist fruitcake. (laughs) Well, I feel the question that everyone wants to know, which is like whenever anyone ever, you know, drags a jar of honey out of an Egyptian Mm -hmm. tomb is... Can, Can you, you eat, eat it? it? Oh. Every time I drag one out, I, I just <laughs> every think, single time. Or, you know, every time someone makes pork in a Petri dish or and they're like, oh, oh, we don't know if you can eat it or not because no one's tried it. So, Are you calling pork? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, who's making pork? Are you saying they've tried this fruitcake? <laughs> well, they say no one has tried the fruitcake, but it looks like it is almost edible, quote, unquote. Almost it's actually pretty edible. cool. <laughs> That's Almost edible. Idea. But that's how I would classify fruit cake just generally. You know? <laughs> really? Not a fan I of fruit I love cake. I'm not a big fruit cake fan. Like it's always a bit disappointing if you go to a wedding and instead of, you know Chocolate cake. Chocolate. <laughs> yeah. It's like this is like traditional fruit cake. You know they're gonna keep that for a year. I have to say I'm off. I'm I'm with you on the fruit yeah. cake a bit, Penny. Yeah. yeah. Not oh, my no, that boiled fruit cake at Christmas that Nana used to put together, you know. Uh, she'd start this months beforehand. It was so cool. It was really special. Christmas but I think it had a lot to do with the brandy sauce. Yeah, exactly. On. I was going to say, because I like Christmas pudding, which is very similar yeah. to fruit cake, yeah. except I mm. traditionally have it, you know, doused in alcohol. It's a lot more moist because of the alcohol. But, I mean, <laughs> so I assume this was frozen, yeah, this fruit? Yeah, it just- yeah. It was um, in one of the, um, the huts on Scott's expedition, I think. Mm-hmm. The, is it the Terra Nova hut? Yep. That it was found in. Yeah. And I guess what it shows is, I mean, I guess that fruitcake has probably caught people's attention because it's like, well, can you eat it? It's so <laughs> old. But um, it is a great environment for preservation. Like it's so cold. Not a lot is going to happen to organics there. 
And apparently it's been re- the Terra Nova hut has been restored by a heritage, tr- um, heritage trust to look essentially like it did 100 years ago. So the artifacts that are found, things like fruitcakes, get restored and returned to their original locations, which is really in some ways a bit weird because it's not like you're going to – I don't know. I guess it makes me think about the point of – conservation because it's not like people are going to go there to look at this and or yeah see, I, I, not I, a I tourist it's similar to things like uh, yeah it's a bit like uh, sunken ships you know that that are that are heritage you know areas and sort of regarded as cemeteries for the for, for those who the, died yeah. it's kind of similar it's not like anyone can go to it or not very many can in fact yeah, I guess. another story this week was um that the Indianapolis had been found, which was the the I think it was a destroyer that that uh, was sunk towards the end of World War Two, and it's 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 very well known because quite a few sailors you know got off the ship, but the navy didn't know that it had sunk, and so for four days a lot of these sailors were in the ocean, and many of them apparently were were uh, attacked by sharks over this time, so it's quite well known this 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 story. But they've just found the wreck of the Indianapolis. And I know this is a massive tangent, but it's it, it was actually one of the things I was reading today, trying to find another story to talk about and uh, it's kinda cool. But you know, that's been that's now a, a heritage site as well that's uh you know, part of our history I guess. But you know, it's easy when it's Antarctic because what the hell else are you can do with it? You know Well it's, it's not it's not so much making it a heritage site, but to actively restore it. Yeah. That seems a Although lot of I guess, if you wanna, I guess if something is a, a heritage site and you want to study it, you can't just take everything away. I don't know. Yeah. But according to this story, they mm. they put the fruit cake back. Back, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Without yeah. trying it first? Without trying it first. Well, it was all wrapped up, I think. Um, yeah. I, I want to know whether the fruit cake – I'm assuming they took the fruit cake from England? Oh, apparently there was right? a company that would basically like package up fruitcake for long distance transport. So it'd be wrapped up in, I think, fabric and then put in a tin. Yeah. So, there's so some... they took it with them to Antarctica. Mm. The majority of that expedition died mm. and no one got to eat the damn cake. No one That ate just the cake. seems a bit disappointing. Like I'm disappointed when I don't get to finish a whole pizza because I. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone when you die and can't finish it off. <laughs> when I die, that'll be like you'd be, you'd be lying there on the ice sheet going, oh, crap, that fruitcake, we forgot it. It's back yeah, in the well, heart. You never Damn know. It. You're there for three I was years or to so. That with a bit of brandy sauce. But you might be sick of fruitcake by then. You know, you're there for mm. three years and that's the main sort of treat that you get. Because, of course, it, it's high in fat and it's high in sugar. So it's got all these calories that you need to get through a grueling Antarctic exploration. But. Yeah, the British biscuit company Huntley and Palmers. So, all wow. the way from England. We make it for the yeah. It's we're in it for the long haul. So all actually, <laughs> the whole expedition died, didn't they? The Scottish. Yeah, expedition. yeah, all, I think so. Mm. They made it to the South Pole, but they all died. Yeah, mm. on the way back. Mm. Well, that okay. It was going to be a, a happy sort of well, joking little note, note to end on, and you've just brought out the fact that everyone died. Um, anyway. <laughs> Well, sorry. I mean, it's hard to ignore. <laughs> it it is did. a major part of that uh, story that everybody... I wonder if they were saving that fruitcake for when they got back. Because mm. that's that's actually... Sorry, that's even worse. <laughs> 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 Bad enough that they died, but they were saving the fruitcake. It's cake the treat they were on. looking forward to. Mm. Oh, well. Now, it's it's there for someone in another hundred years to maybe come by mm. and have a nibble. Yeah. Oh, this looks almost edible. Almost edible. <laughs> Uh, I think that's our show. All the links to the stories we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 275. Let us know what you think by leaving a comment on the website, get in touch with us on social media, or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you like the show and you want to help us make more, head to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledge on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. No worries, Ed. This episode was edited with a cup of tea and some delicious fruitcake by Marcos Benamu. Thank you everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Here's what I don't get. You know what? This is my iPhone. This is my iPhone. This is my, my, my electronic...
uh, by Bluetooth, Bluetooth mouse from a computer down in there. If I put this here and my phone here, I have a total eclipse of the phone. I do, from my perspective. I, have a, I cannot see my phone, for I only see my mouse pad, my mouse. Okay. It's a, it's a total eclipse of the phone. Okay. I mean... I, I'm having a total eclipse of the brain I, here. Yeah. I, 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 it's <laughs> fascinating. It's amazing. Oh, my God. The moon has gotten in front of this. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't know. It's interesting looking. The sun looks a little like the moon up there in my wall. You know, that's interesting. Uh, I, I'm certainly enjoying it. It's better than having to read up on something all day long. According to one legend from ancient China, China, people were scared that a dragon might eat the sun, which it's always something to consider.